how do we learn about this external physical world out there, the element with the elements? And then how do we learn about other people? Because of those, those are three big chunks of experience and learning that we have to accomplish during our lives. And the main way, the main opening that we've been given is these senses. And Rudolf Steiner described that there are 12 of them. And last night we went through that to get a picture of what each of these senses helps us come to experience in the world. I'm going to wait on that because um, we're going to have a little interlude first before we, we get really settled into some heavy thinking work. And, uh, yeah. And the young child is really devoted to working with those particular sensory experiences. And that's what we're going to really concentrate on today and get as much of a, of a sensing, I mean, a, a thinking, yes, but we need to have a sense, an experience for how these things um, work for us and with us and how we utilize them in finding our way solidly and confidently and securely in, into physical life. So, I mentioned last night that there are two things that Rudolf Steiner, sort of little aphorisms that are, are, are pole stars for me, that just chunk something down so amazingly. He says, first of all, is that you cannot, we cannot understand anything conceptually that we have not experienced. Which, unfortunately, most of education now gives us the concept. And if we're really lucky, really lucky, then we might have an experience to illustrate that so we can see. But I do remember high school chemistry. Learn the theorem, you know, whatever it is, you know. Chemistry, I've, as soon as I got out of there, I was where it went. Okay, I thought it was so boring. Just boring, and it was it was backwards to how everything is presented in Waldorf education. Is you have the adventure of the experience first, without anybody telling you anything about it, not prejudicing your possibility of entering into it in a new and uh, exciting way. And then all the after the experience, then is then you you begin to talk about well, huh, what what was that about? What what might have been happening there? And all the ideas are offerable, and all questions are answerable. It's way open-ended. Isn't that a nice thing? So we're going to go do that right now. So leave all of your um, stuff here. All you need is your body. OK, so I have a confession. I was born old, and my goal in life, or I think my task in life, is to figure out how to be a kid. So here we go. <laughs> I warn you that we, we are going to, um, you will have the invitation to drop to the floor and roll on your back with this one. You may or may not do so. Okay. Okay. A wrangle, a wrangle of coxes, butter in the boxes, just about to spill. Come now and have your fill. If you wait any longer, you will have a tumble spill. Okay, again. <laughs> Ringle a wrangle of coxes, butter in the boxes, just about to spill. Come now and have your fill. If you wait any longer, you will have a tumble spill. <laughs> Okay, everything in threes. <laughs> and the laughter in six. Right? <laughs> wrangle a wrangle of coxes, butter in the boxes, just about to spill. Come now and have your fill. If you wait any longer, you will have a tumble spill. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to visit Sally going around the sun. I know there are lots of tunes to this, so I'll just <coughs> sing. And <laughs> we'll go all the way through the week from Saturday um, back to Friday. So we'll be 
Seven times we'll be doing this, okay. Sally go round the sun, Sally go round the moon, Sally go round the chimney pot on a Saturday afternoon. Woo! <laughs> Sally go round the sun, Sally go round the moon, Sally go round the chimney pot on a Sunday afternoon. Woo! Sally go round the sun, Sally go round the moon, Sally go round the chimney pot on a Monday afternoon. Woo! Sally go round the sun. Well, how do you feel? Awake. Awake, yeah. Awake yes. Happy. Happy. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, we have experienced so many things on many, many different levels um, th that it's really quite amazing. Now, I have to tell you about, particularly not the first one, I, I knew I, the first one that we did today, I recognized as very wise when I found it in a, in a Waldorf book of Dutch children's singing games. The other two were just you know, kind of hanging around in, in my repertoire and were sort of kind of nice little things to do here and there with the children. Uh, and then when I began to study this in terms of becoming a therapeutic educator, suddenly you know, the book opened and I could see what was going on. And what was going on is that we were working very, very rhythmically between these two senses, between the vestibular sense, which Steiner also calls balance, and what he calls self-movement, and the mainstream calls the proprioceptive sense. There's a kind of a breathing that goes between these two. And if we're able to uh, embrace that and recognize that in our lives, it's a great help personally for ourselves as we kind of, um, how do you say, the word in sensory integration that's used is regulate, self-regulation. Whether if you're too, your idol is way too high, how do, you, how do you calm yourself down? How do you bring it down? Not squelch yourself, but put yourself in, in the range of normal so that you can participate um, effectively and socially um, pleasantly. In, in your life, or if, you, if your motor isn't running at all and you're very, very lethargic, how can you get yourself moving so that you, you can participate? So we've got both of those extremes, the hyperactive and the hypoactive, the under, underactive. And we see, we, we all have moments of those in our lives every day. It's normal to experience those extremes. But then there are some children who they only know themselves. We, it's only when we get to be older that we, the door opens to say, you mean you're not having exactly the same experience that I am? I thought everybody saw things the way I see it, felt things the way I see it, experienced things that way. And then, of course, we have now, well, of course everybody thinks the way I do. And that as a presumption, and it's not, we know that it isn't true. But it's quite an awakening um, to come to an appreciation of the uniqueness of each of us and our individuality, which is very special and needs to be honored and protected. But we may experience ourselves leaning toward one extreme or the other that doesn't really suit uh, the way we want to live our life or that the practical demands that are called upon us for. So it's a kind of a breathing between these two things. and so. Uh, last night, we spoke a little bit about these, <clears throat> and there are handouts for anyone who wasn't here last night. Plus, kind of accidentally, because I wasn't clear in an email I sent through to Melissa last night, if, if you suddenly are so gripped by wanting to know a lot about this, my research notes, are, there's a copy for each of you, <laughs> about vestibular proprioceptive and about the image of the blood coming to the back of the eye. I found it last night. So I've got that for you. And anybody else who wants to know about that. that there are these two gestures that we, all, that we breathe back and forth in, literally, and then figuratively, and then in our thinking life and so on. This gesture of the vestibular, of balance, which is a kind of a swirling, twirling, coursing around that tends to be more out on, on the periphery. 
And so every traditional children's circle game that, ha that, that children love to play, like Ring Around the Rosie. So when I started teaching in the kindergarten in the Waldorf School, I thought, oh, I must come with something new and innovative every day. Or not every day, but because, oh, those boring old things. What did they like to play? <laughs> Ring Around the Rosie. Endlessly, they never tired of it. And that, very, that perplexed me. I, I was uh, such a newbie. <laughs> I was invited into the kindergarten because so, uh, suddenly there was a vacancy that needed to be filled urgently because a person had to leave on family leave. And finally, there was nobody trained or experienced available. And someone said, well, what about Nancy? She's kind of good with kids. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's how I got into the world of kindergarten. Thank you, God. Um, but I, di I didn't know about these things, and I, I, I was puzzled by what I saw, because I didn't know what the children were showing to us. Well, that kind of a game, we circle around like wrangle wrangle of coxes, butter in the boxes. We're circling out on the periphery, and then we come uh, into self, into what we call the point. Each of those games is like that. So I'll go around the sun, so I'll go around the moon, so I'll go around the chimney pot on a Sunday afternoon. Jump! Here I am. Come to stillness. Consolidate myself. Jump Jim Joe is a much, much more gentle um, experience of that. And, and again, with my tune-up for Eurythmy lesson with the children, we would start being very vigorous where they were out here, really out there, and then kind of calming that down a little bit, bringing it a little more still to the place where then they could be receptive to what was coming in the door with the Eurythmist. And so we vacillate between those two things all the time, one way or the other. When working with children in the kindergarten, that we know one of the, one of the tenets, and it's not just in the kindergarten, it's all through Waldorf education, that the lesson as it's presented to the children has to breathe. So it's not just there has to be a breath. And so where do the breaths come? Well, they come literally in warming up and singing and playing the flutes and all of those things. That's one kind of, that's a literal physical breath. It comes in a pause in the lesson um, for a bathroom break and get a drink of water. That's a breath. It comes when the teacher is, uh, brings forth laughter. Oh, an out-breath. And then after there's an out-breath, and then we're, we're gathered again to, to be able to take another in-breath and in concentration and paying attention to the lesson and being receptive. If we don't do that, um, we sabotage the lesson because it's asking too much of the human being to do that. It's unhealthy. It's really unhealthy. So in the kindergarten, it's very, very obvious in where the in-breath is and where the out-breath is. And you'll see it in the schedule of the day, or the schedule of the morning for the children. When we're doing it in circle time, and this is, this is my passionate love, is figuring out how to bring this in-breath, out-breath to the children so that they have a healthy breathing of being able to expand and then come in, here I am, and then expand and here I am. Or if the whole group is, um, the north wind doth blow and we shall have snow. We're holding hands and what will the robin do then, poor thing? He'll fly in the barn to keep himself warm and hide his head under his wing, poor thing. Ah! We're holding hands, so we're doing it individually and we're doing it as a group. This expansion and coming in together participating, cooperating with another, and then we're coming out again in a release. So that's what we were experiencing out there. Now, therapeutically, which is to take our normal inclinations that some are another and some children have, are, are skewed to an imbalanced position. Totally out of the control of the child. Because we have very, various inclinations that we bring. has to do with our heredity as well. Because you know, so I've been to, to uh, treat myself or reward myself for doing my back exercises every morning, which are very boring. 
I have a set of tapes on music appreciation, very interested in music history, and recently heard a part about the Bach family. So it wasn't only Johann Sebastian Bach, who was the great composer, musician, but he, he had, I don't know, I forget how many children, 23, and I think 14 or so of them were musicians and composers. And so it said, you know, that's no accident. It wasn't just because daddy was a musician that they became musicians too. There was a special hereditary gift in the ear, in their ability to perceive sound and imagine sound. And so some, you know, some of us are born with, with into families that are artistic and the children gather those things up and so on. So we have those things that we bring with us and we have inclinations that are hmm, great gifts and we have inclinations.